On the eve of February 23, 2022, Eastern Standard Time, a small group of singers in Toronto had already gathered to sing with Ukraine. They represented a community of singers and other arts-oriented people in Toronto with varying degrees of interest in Eastern European musics, who simply got together to express camaraderie and concern over the Russian military buildup around Ukraine. It was serendipitous that they were gathered together to sing the very moment when the war broke out. Since then, singing polyphonic Ukrainian folk songs by this community has channeled the cathartic powers of these songs into education, raising awareness and fundraising. They started with singers who were professional musicians and a purpose to sing in the traditional Ukrainian style described in Canada as Aridni Holos or native voice. Most of the songs, come from a complex polyphonic tradition that is even hard to access in the Ukraine. And as I have described in other papers on the topic, identifies this singing as part of a transnational revival movement with a unique Toronto style. <clears throat> Political kolyada and guerrilla caroling were the terms first used. And kolyada, by the way, means Christmas carol, but it also references the activity of caroling. <clears throat> so these were the terms used almost immediately by the singers to identify their initial musical activism involved, which involved interrupting the scheduled program at different Toronto venues to awaken people from indifference. <clears throat> Along with caroling were short speeches highlighting updated information about the war, Russian misinformation campaigns, and the validity of Ukraine as a unique culture. The audiences were also encouraged to be active, whether that meant simply staying informed with credible news sources, writing companies and government agencies to change their relations with Russia, donating to reliable organizations or other ways. <clears throat> this paper will document the activities of these singers reviewing the origins and the development of their musical practice, identify how aspects of singing with Ukraine reflects an organic folk practice, a defining character of the practice um, is an energy or drive linking their powerful singing to the intense outreach of their humanitarian efforts. It is curious, however, that such a powerful organic folk practice can arise in Toronto, so far from the homeland, from people and culture clearly repressed for hundreds of years, with a musical form that has historically been underrepresented. To address this, the paper contextualizes the vastness of this polyphonic tradition, <clears throat> and its historic underrepresentation or obscurity. Then provides some background to the diaspora communities in Toronto. A concluding section further explores the drive mentioned above. Three days before the war started, some concerned messages on and the desire to meet and sing were sent on the WhatsApp 2022 Kolyada group. Caroling, especially on January 7th, was a big event for the community, which you can get a sense of in this video. Many singers, including those from non-Ukrainian backgrounds, were siphoned into two or three caroling groups of six to eight singers, each sent to bring blessings and carols to about five or seven households in the evening. The evening always ended in a mass of kolyadniki, or carolers, at a prominent Ukrainian's house, a mansion where musicians and carolers were welcome to celebrate Christmas. But this hadn't happened since January of 2020 because of the pandemic. And for Kolyada 2022, there were only four singers at the start and two more joined with the last two houses. On February 23, four singers met at an apartment. They were singing songs, Ukrainian and others, and just chatting when the war broke out. Disbelief and shock followed by one more song, Plivikacha, a lament turned anthem for the fallen in the Maidan of 2014. A few texts were shared with other concerned community members who weren't there and the singers went home, but the evening didn't end. A messenger group chat started at 1.30 a.m. expressing the need to do something. By 8 a.m., a few more were added to the group and they started organizing a benefit concert. By 12 p.m., more members had been added and some were featured on Curtain Call, a live Instagram show. They were talking about the war and offering ways to support. By 1.20 p.m., the graphic for Sing With Ukraine was created and shared. <clears throat> the messenger group chat kept growing with people ready to aid in the defense efforts for Ukraine. Most worked in music or other arts, but not all were singers and a new 
group chat formed for the singers, which consisted of Ukrainians, Ukrainian Canadians, Poles, a Russian, Sephardic Jewish Canadians, Canadian Italian, and a mixed Western European Canadian First Nation. The primary goal was to network, mobilize, and help defense efforts in Ukraine. It was incredibly humbling to watch this community react and mobilize so quickly to the sudden and unimaginable terror of war. They facilitated transportation and lodging for those seeking refuge, advocated and organized services for unfairly treated visible minorities, compiled reliable media, donor agencies, and form letters to governments and corporations, compiled lists of supplies needed and listed drop-off points, and organized a massive musical fundraiser. It was an unbelievable whirlwind of chaotic organization, logistics, messaging, Google Docs and Sheets, Slack channels, Instagram posts and stories. Their drive no doubt paralleled the mobilization of Ukrainians fighting in Ukraine at the same time. <clears throat> and in the midst of all this, getting together to sing was cathartic, a solace. But it was also done for a point. Powerful polyphonic songs were sung for audiences at different venues in Toronto, interspersed with messages about the validity of Ukrainian culture, the right to live peacefully in a democratic state, and ways to help you the Ukrainian defense efforts. <clears throat> and I'm going to play you some videos, only a few, I have more here. Um, so this is the first one I'm going to play is from the rally that happened the very next day at Toronto City Hall. It was a massive rally. Uh, we got together and met in one corner of the, the the square. We were singing far away from where there was a stage. Someone heard us and said, go to the stage and sing. And so we sang this song. Right, so I'm going to go to the next video, and um, I just want to contextualize. So I, this is a screenshot I made of the Big Fam Jam, um, Big Fam Jam's story page on Instagram. So, you know, these work with little clips. They're not always consecutive clips of a song. The first two clips of, of, of the song, Plivakacha, that anthem I mentioned earlier, folk song turned anthem. The, the clip after that is a, uh, a, a toasting song. Um, and I just want you to pay attention to what the audience is doing. The audience is actually singing along a drone with us for the first one, and then the second one, well, you'll, you'll witness it yourself, how different the interaction is. And the, there's the final small little clip that demonstrates what normally happens there on the night. The Big Fam Jam is a, uh, it's, a it's like for the youth of Toronto, musical creative youth of Toronto, and it's a really big funky jam. <clears throat> So through traditional Ukrainian songs, Sing With Ukraine channeled the profound collective memory of courage and strength that Ukrainian people have needed in past wars and genocide. The power of these collective memories came clearly through these songs and offered affected audiences in just a profound way. Even when they sang at the popular Drake Hotel or the supermarket's Big Fam Jam, where the hip youth of Toronto gathered ready to party and celebrate the end of COVID lockdowns, those youth all stood quietly and listened. When asked, they all joined in on the drone to accompany the singers. And when the songs were over, they cheered with such enthusiasm and force that it felt like Ukraine would be able to withstand anything. Many audiences reacted the same way. And there were stories of young people in particular coming to the singers saying they had no interest in politics and never wanted to be political, but are thinking differently after our performance. What songs were sung at a performance was rather ad hoc and initially established by the urgency and the need to perform. By the end of the second day of the war, we had already sang in five different venues, sets of one to five songs in length. 
There was no time to rehearse. <clears throat> Lyrics were shared uh, by taking screenshots at the venue. If you were lucky, you had a moment to review the part outside of the February cold before taking to the stage. If not, you learned your part on the spot. Most of the singers were professional, strong singers, experienced with the Rigni style. So their first performances came off really well. Some lyrics and some audio files of our YouTube videos were shared via the group chat in an attempt to increase the repertoire, but a repertoire of seven songs rather quickly established, featuring a cross section of happy, solemn, and epic tunes. We rarely sang them all in a set, but it was important to combine solemn and serious songs with uplifting ones. <clears throat> Within the first month, we sang at 14 different venues. The first four to six weeks represented a truly organic practice, supported by the voices of their fellow singers, we sang freely in the moment with little thought other than to manifest our desire for peace and survival. Challenges set in when more formal and lucrative performance opportunities arose at the end of April, which meant more finesse and more repertoire. This was particularly demanding for singers since COVID restrictions were lifting and everyone was getting busier with work. While the group was not grown, had not grown much in size, the 10 to 11 singers that performed for these new, more important and lengthier shows were not all professionals. And many of those who were professionals did not have a lot of choral experience, especially the choral experience that requires rehearsing and performing with mixed levels of skill. Rehearsals were not just fraught with scheduling issues, but also with the inability to have a strong choral leadership that wouldn't interfere with the socially inclusive community atmosphere of the group. Some aspects of rehearsing the group seemed counterintuitive to the group's formation, which was based on the guerrilla styled ad hoc impromptu performances. Attempts were made to draw in new singers from May through to August song workshops exposed many new singers to Ukrainian polyphony. A little vocal technique was discussed in the workshops, but mostly focused on repertoire. Only a few singers were successfully recruited through these workshops, and these new singers still needed training, sometimes being challenged with singing in tune, the appropriate part, or the power of the Ritni style. <clears throat> By mid-June, the group evolved into a performance group that raised a money that raises continued to raises money and awareness for Ukraine. Guerrilla-styled singing was no longer the modus operandi. Performances became critically thought out, premeditated, and an intentional process. Rehearsals became mandatory to distribute parts and ensure the power of the song. Like before, the songs were still organized into a narrative to remind listeners that Ukraine is Europe's largest country, that every generation of Ukrainians has gone through war or acts of genocide, and that this trauma, as well as the desire to be expressive and happy, sonically shapes the song sung. While not maintaining the offstage energy and exuberance of the early days, <clears throat> the group's songs and message are still very powerful and well received. So let's take a moment to reflect. Before the stage performance orientation, Sing with Ukraine seemed to embody a more organic and authentic urban folk practice that naturally arose and was intrinsically or intricately linked with the incredible busy activity of their defense efforts. While I can point to all sorts of musical aspects of this earlier practice, songs sung, the tuning, timbre, distribution of voices, stage presentation, costumes, etc., I maintain that the defining characteristic was their energy and drive that motivated the will to perform, guided the group's singing and musical phrasing, bonded the group through musical performance, and seamlessly integrated the music with the excessive humanitarian work. As already mentioned, this energy and drive seemed to parallel the drive Ukrainians in Ukraine had at the moment to fight the war. It also paralleled the drive people had in Kyiv in 2013-2014 Maidan to so effectively mobilize and organize themselves into a quasi-city with medical units, guards, builders, cooks, etc. What remains most striking of Sing with Ukraine is how such a powerful organic folk practice arose in Toronto, especially given the obscurity of the musical tradition and the somewhat engineered and or diluted character of Toronto Ukrainian culture. The vastness of this tr tradition is clearly demonstrated through the Polyphony Project, the largest online archive of traditional Ukrainian songs. Started only in 2014, it now hosts over 2,000 songs from 11 ethnographic regions with excellent audio and video recording quality and online multi-track control so you can hear each part separately. The database can be searched by lyrics, genre, location, ethnographic region, theme, subjects, etc. So we're going to listen to one example, and it shows how we can manipulate those multi-tracking controls. So uh, we're going to solo the top voice. Right? We're going to hear the beautiful top voice. 
What is really shocking about the vastness of traditional Ukrainian polyphony is its obscurity. I had no idea of this richness. I only sort of got a sense of it in 2013 when I first attended just a local folk art workshop in my in Toronto. And um, I'm not only of Ukrainian descent growing up listening to Ukrainian tunes in my grandparents' household, but I also had at that time been studying, seriously studying Georgian polyphony for almost 10 years. And I had no idea this existed. The truth is, Vocal polyphony in Ukraine has been systematically undermined. According to Joseph Zordania, Ukrainian ethnomusicologists, dis Ukrainian ethnomusicologists displayed a total neglect for their own polyphonic tradition. The polyphonic project was not even in initiated by Ukrainian, but a Hungarian musician ethnographer. Even today, if you search for polyphony or folk choir on Ukrainian media sites, there are very few results. Of course, all of Ukrainian culture, like many local cultures, was repressed from Russian colonization and then Sovietization. The systematic institutionalization and naturalization of undermining Ukrainian vocal polyphony is complex to analyze, but some insights might be gained by considering Lara Pellegrinelli's argument for why singers have been omitted from jazz historiography. In jazz discourse, singers, according to Lara Pellegrinelli, uh, it, jazz singers um, are, or singers in the jazz discourse are limited to only a precursor of jazz because the voice associated with the body is seen as untrained and emotional, the folk, the vernacular. And in gender and cultural studies, these are typically the qualities associated with the female. This is in contrast with the instrument, which is associated with the male due to its technical demands, intellect, and skill required for conquering it and mastering it. These features thus legitimize instrumental jazz in a Western cultural sense and further plays into all sorts of colonialist tropes told through the birthing and great man genius histories of jazz, which is part of the process of acquiring the cultural capital that turned jazz into an art music. So we can imagine then how Ukraine uh, absorbed such Western colonial values as well, and shunned vocal polyphony and prize of the genius character of some of the instrumental and more developed melodic and lyrical songs. Um, in, and of course, this was done to legitimize Ukrainian folk music in a larger global sense. Thus, uh, instrumental music, for example, such as the Kobzar tradition, with its lyrical use of historical subjects set to song accompanied by the sophisticated bandura, are more highly valued than many of the unintelligible vocables that are, uh, are part of the songs and the narrow melodies of rural Ukrainian women. The Canadian diaspora is no exception to this devaluing of Ukrainian polyphony. There are, however, varying degrees of Ukrainianness which need to be recognized. As a third generation Canadian Ukrainian, to rural, uh, mostly uneducated grandparents who immigrated in the late 1920s, the Ukrainian culture I inherited was very it was a very muted expression. The closest I came to folk was listening to Trio Maranich, which featured beautiful Ukrainian melodies sung by the perfect academic blend of two female voices and a bass accompanied by guitar. In comparison, my friends who are third generation Ukrainians from grandparents who were business professionals and intellectuals that immigrated in the 40s and 50s, all speak Ukrainian, went to Ukrainian schools and summer camps and were part of a highly functioning insular community of Ukrainians who were conscientiously institutionalizing the, the distinctness of their culture. Many more folk elements survived and circulated in this diaspora. Major calendar events like Kalyada, Malanka, Hayevke, Ivana Kupalo, and other rituals were celebrated, but arguably were still muted. For example, the pagan elements like the cross-dressing Malanka stage show character for the Ukrainian New Year super dances that occur in banquet halls, or the fortune-telling and eccentric performances of forest nymphs covered in uga buga mud for the summer solstice festival at youth camps. These survived, but obviously in the diluted and maybe distorted way, um, divorcing them from any meaning and being entertaining, performative, and identifying them as just something distinctly Ukrainian. 
The singers of uh, Sing with Ukraine, who don't all have Ukrainian heritage and their experience of, of singing Uridni Holos did not come from either of these diaspora communities. The singers came through a singing practice in Canada that started around 2011 with the development of COSA, COSA Collective, a Ukrainian Canadian initiated folk arts based multicultural community in Toronto. The four founding members of COSA are third generation immigrants that grew up in the insular community, and the creation of COSA was in part a reaction to this insular nature of the diaspora Ukrainian, the, of their diaspora Ukrainianness. The singing practice more. Uh, specifically, can be traced to one of the four founding members, Bojana Hrsuna, who brought back this will to sing from her uh, experiences in Ukraine in 2009, although she didn't actually sing the polyphony in Ukraine herself. She was, has trouble explaining why she wanted to sing or share the desire to sing, but doing so went hand in hand with other folk forms that Kosa was active in, such as crafting, canning, cooking, egg decorating, embroidering, etc., and helped connect her to a revival of authentic folk, which at times distanced her from the Ukrainian Canadian inheritances that she, her Ukrainian Canadian inheritances that suddenly and sometimes painfully seemed hokey or contrived. I'm gonna start playing this longish clip of Cosa Collective's Hayavke Spring Celebration to give you a sense of the flavor and multicultural makeup of the community. But to save time, I'm gonna turn the volume down and talk behind it. The polyphonic singing, which started in 2011, involved workshops and singing nights that helped develop repertoire and the Ridni technique. Most importantly, however, singing for Kosa was never organized for the stage, like the diaspora choirs and the dance groups they grew up with. Singing was meant to be a part of a larger interdisciplinary community experience, where dressing in costumes, displaying or partaking in crafts, storytelling, games, ritual, and dance enhanced and reinforced and heightened the experience of the meaning of singing. Unquestionably, this framing of singing infused it with energy. How could it not, when so much energy and coordination had to go in these community events? The impetus for these events rested on Costa's organizational ab ability, energy, and drive. This energy and drive, while not something really tangible we can account for and challenging to describe, imbued the experience of singing Ukrainian polyphony and was formative in the practice in Toronto. So this was this all happened in one afternoon. It was incredible. <clears throat> all right, so. Um, Bojana qualifies her vaguely expressed desire to share folk culture after being in Ukraine by describing the power of the songs, their melodies, and particularly the lyrical meaning, which, in reference to the war, death, and survival, have remarkable currency today. There was, however, no war in 2001 when, 2009 when she was first moved by them, at which time she described them as unapologetic, in your face, real. Unapologetic in your face and real highlight the energy and drive behind the songs. The drive is embedded, uh, embedded not just in Ukrainian vocal polyphony and the practices in Toronto, but also in the will of the citizens rallying in the 2013-14 Maidan and the heroism of the fighters in Ukraine now. This is the drive to love and express without restraint a distinct Ukrainian identity, something that was repressed for so long under Russian and Soviet rule and has clearly thrived since Ukrainian independence. The drive has become a thread that weaves throughout this paper. The drive comes from the memory and stories of collective trauma and joy, which shape the songs lyrically and sonically. They drive their performance and make them so real and palpable, so in your face. This drive is not just inherited in the songs, but also inherited from them, which makes it transferable and explains how so many non-Ukrainians connect deeply with the music. It explains how an elderly Anglo-Saxon couple at Toronto's high-profile cultural festival in July of 22 lifted their imaginary shot glasses and toasted back with verb as the singers of Sing With Ukraine ended their drinking song. And it explains, um, and, and it explains how it made those indifferent 20-something-year-old kids at the supermarket nightclub who in their very lucky, privileged, and peaceful young lives have absolutely no first or even secondhand connection to death and war, stop and think profoundly about the politics and inhumanity of war. It explains the power and natural practices of Sing with Ukraine and their ability to stop people from being indifferent, 
even if just for a moment. Thank you. Thank you.